name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that you're doing well this morning. What a joy to be here this morning in the presence of the Lord, in your homes, and all around the world with our friends. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and we will be glad in it. It's wonderful to welcome all of you this morning in the presence of the Lord. And uh, let us pray together and give thanks to the Lord for all his mercies. Father, this morning we enter your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praises on our lips. Lord, we worship, we bow down. Lord, we return all the glory and all the praise for your loving kindness. We thank you for your constant care. We thank you for your wonderful provisions for us. Lord, as we come this morning, we come into the holies where we may see you face to face. Lord, we need you this morning and we pray that once again you stretch out your loving hands and you meet each and every one of us at the point of our need. As we open your word this morning, Lord, we do ask that, Lord, that you will open our hearts and bless us with the understanding of your word this morning. We thank you. We bless your name. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. It's good to welcome you once again to the presence of the Lord this morning. And if you have your Bible, this morning we'll be reading from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 25. We're going to read the first 13 uh, verses. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourself. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Verse 13, watch therefore, for you know neither the day or the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. This is the word of the Lord. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts this morning. Amen. This is one of the parables of our Lord Jesus and is one of those very famous parable. Everyone who's been around church or Sunday school know the parable of the ten virgins. And this morning we'll attempt to uh, learn some lessons from these parables as it's always the intention of the Lord to uh, teach us life lessons. And our duty is to be able to understand uh, those life lessons to be able to apply to our own lives. Uh, 
From this parable this morning, we will attempt to uh, identify some helpful lessons. First, the lesson uh, in living in wisdom. The lesson in living in wisdom. Secondly, the lesson against assumptions. Lessons against assumptions. Thirdly, uh, a lesson to pay attention to the spiritual life. And fourthly, let a lesson in continuous and steady spiritual growth as is evidence that's, that's the key to living abundantly. It is continuous and steady spiritual growth is key to abundant living. Now, you remember John chapter 10, uh, verse 10. Jesus said, The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I am come, that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Now, the intention and the will of God for us is this abundant living. In fact, that is the reason Jesus said he came, that we might have. It is the reason why he gave up his life. He gave up his life uh, so that he, you know, we can have his life. As you will read through the book of Ephesians, you will find this keyword in him, in him, in him. In him we have redemption, in him we have forgiveness of our sins, in him. We are seated also in him. Uh, all of our, uh, of our freedom, liberty uh, was accomplished because Jesus himself uh, gave his life. The scripture says, he him, who himself bore our sins in his own body. All that Jesus did is to do for us. He came down, that means he identified with us. So God's will for us is to have abundant living. But there is, there is things that we have to do. There is God's sovereignty, God's provision, but there is man's responsibilities. Uh, you know, if, if you somebody gave you money and transferred money into your account, that money will stay there in your account. Uh, you can be sure that the bank is not going to come and knock at your door and, and give you the money. You have to write a check. In fact, you know, uh, if you pay attention and you look at the check, you know, the, the, the check, uh, it's actually a, a command. A command to that institution, you, you will see uh, you say, pay to the order of so, 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 and so, and you put your signature and your bank or whatever that financial institution must honor your command. And God has given us so much deposit in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1 verse 3 says that, Blessed be the God of our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. You and I need to put a demand on those blessings and if there are things in our life or habits that are against you know, us living abundantly, we need to discover it and, and do better with our, our lives. Jesus told parables, and I want you to know the power of parables, the intent of parables. Uh, there are many incidents you know, where you know, we read through the gospel actual true life stories also they are there for us to uh, be able to take away from those stories lessons for our life and live it but sometimes jesus will try to capture the attention of those who were hearing him and as a master storyteller he will start to paint uh, a picture because he knows well that men learn through pictures. And he will come up with these stories, and these stories are aimed at teaching us something. He comes up with parables. Parables 
uh, uh, stories that take things that are common to us, things that we already know, to illustrate spiritual truth. And in many of our Lord's parables, several of his parables, they, they are pointed towards something. Uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan teaches about public life and social responsibility. Lesson from this story is warning about uselessness, you know, the, the habit of do nothing. You know, if you remember the story, there were some people, uh, the, the Levites, the priests, and uh, the other one who went by, the man who was bleeding and dying on the Jericho Road. You know, all of them excuse themselves. They excuse themselves um, from helping uh, the man who was in need. Now, there was no positive wrong reported of these men or these travelers except that they did nothing to help the dying man. You know, uh, the parable of the talents. Uh, you remember in Matthew 25, uh, 14 to 30. This parable, uh, it's about business. Uh, the Lord explained that a man, uh, for the kingdom of heaven, is like a man traveling to a far country. He called his servants and delivered his goods to them. He gave them several uh, amount of money for them to trade with until he, he came back. Well, he gave one, five, five talents. Talents there is uh, more money. Uh, it's not skill, um, and he gave one five talents, he gave one two, and another one was given one. Uh, those two, they were given, the one given five and the one given two, they went out, traded, invested, and they made uh, more. The one given five made five more, the one given two made two more. The one given one, however, uh, went and he actually buried it to keep it. Uh, and then when the master came, those other two were really excited to see their master. Uh, when you read the parable, this, there's a statement they made when their master returned. And it, it was, Lord, look, you gave me five. Lord, look, you gave me two. And I have made five more. I have made two more. Jesus was painting a story. He was talking to us about business. You know, after all, you know, life is a life, the whole of life is business. We trade and we, we buy and sell. And I'm not talking about, you know, just equipment or goods. I'm talking about, you know, all of our lives. You are paid for the time that you give on your job. That's buying and selling in every, every level. Now, uh, the story ends up with punishment you know, for the one who did nothing. So uh, there was no other charge brought against the man who buried his talent. He's only accused by his master, again, for doing nothing. So different parables, but aiming uh, at the point, uh, warning us against uselessness, you know, uh, and doing nothing with what God has given us. You remember the most famous of all parables, the key to all parables, that parable of the soil. You know, some like to refer to it as the parable of the sower. But the sower it was, is not the emphasis about the parable. It is the soil that is the emphasis. So I like to say it's the parable of the soil. So now uh, we see in parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus talking about public life, social responsibility, in the parable of the talent, Jesus talking about business. Now, he, he used agricultural terms. Uh, in Mark 4, 1 to 9, you will find that story there. There were three kinds of soil that was fruitless. Uh, the first one was hard. The second one was stony. The other one was uh, thorny. That other one had prospect because it was actually... A rich soil because it actually grew. The only problem was it grew tons along with the plant. And you know how tons grow? Tons don't grow like the palm tree. 
The palm tree goes straight and tall. You see, palm trees don't have branches on the side. They go straight and tall. You know, tongues, you know, just go round and round. And if there's anything in their way or in between, they choke it to death. So, uh, this, 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 this thorn soil, this, this thorny soil had prospered. It was a rich soil, but the problem here was rich but busy. Uh, so that, you know, nothing grew. Uh, the choking, choking thorns took the life out of the plant. In all of the cases, the final thought is that all these soils were useless and unproductive. Then, there is the parable of the two sons in Matthew 21, verse 28 to 32. Now, Jesus talked about domestic life, relationship. You know, one son is pictured as amiable, winsome, and well-intentioned and, and gracious. And his father had approached him and said, son, go walk today in my vineyard. And that son said, oh, okay, sir, I'll go, I'll go. But he did not go. However, he went to the other one, the other one, and the, the father said, son, go walk today in my vineyard. And the boy said to his father, no, no, he was very abrupt, he was very disrespectful. And uh, Jesus was painting this picture. He said, one son told his father, yes, I'll go, but he did not go. And then the other son said, no, I don't want to walk today, I'm not going. But later on, that son changed his mind and he went. And it's interesting, at the end of the story, Jesus asked his uh, listeners a question. He said to them, he asked them, which of the two did the father's will? You know what, it, it's a very probing, intelligent question. Jesus did not say, who among the two said yes? He just said, who did the father's will? Even though the one who said no at first come out to be, uh, you know, uh, disrespectful, but he changed his mind. Jesus was talking about the power of repentance and what comes out of, of that. So now the master's praise in this story goes to the other son whose words were, uh, uh, these words were very ungracious at first, but afterward went and did his father's bidding. So we have seen the parable that talk about public life, social responsibility, the parable of Good Samaritan, the parable of talents talk about business, the parable of the soil, you know, the Lord used agriculture to uh, talk about productivity and fruitfulness. And then the parable of two sons is talk about domestic life. Now you hear in this parable of the virgins, you know, uh, the whole idea uh, you will find it in one of those, uh, the verse there, uh, what Jesus was painting. It was a beautiful picture, uh, but aimed at uh, the idea of Christian growth and readiness. Now, uh, if you will uh, just read that Matthew 25 and verse 10, uh, there is a word there, and that is the point of this parable. Matthew 25 verse 10 says, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Amen. So the word there was, uh, and those who were ready. And so the Lord is talking to us about, about readiness. Praise the Lord. So, uh, in this parable, let us let us read again and familiarize ourselves with our lesson today. The first lesson is living in wisdom. Uh, here in verse 1, it says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lambs and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, five of them were wise and five were foolish. Now, uh, right right on from the beginning of the story jesus bring us to the conclusion usually when people write stories uh they don't they don't write this way when people write movies they don't write this way they they start with an introduction and then they lead us and they create some kind of uh, 
problems and then after that problem then the whole of the movie uh, all the story is about trying to find out how to solve that problem but Jesus uh, began and he told us exactly what he's trying to tell us it started with 10 immediately in verse 2 he separated the, those 10 into two groups now five of them were wise and five were foolish right away he's telling us you know uh, there is a decision why were the five wise why were the five foolish uh, it all depends now as we read on in the story uh, in the decisions they make so my friend the first lesson uh, this morning is lesson in living in in wisdom proverbs chapter 4 and in verse 7 we read the words of king solomon proverbs 4 7 says wisdom is the principal thing therefore get wisdom and in all you're getting get what understanding now uh you know I understand what he's saying wisdom is the is the pre, is the most is the fundamental thing it is is the most essential you know i mean most of us have gotten education we have gotten this and we have gotten that but wisdom uh is not something you get in uh, in the library or in in the college you can get you know education you can get some knowledge but wisdom is something totally on a different realm. It is the principal thing. If it's the principal thing, it's something that we cannot do without. Therefore, get wisdom. In all you're getting, whatever you've got, you've gotten this, you've gotten that, and all of that is fine. But make sure you get wisdom because if you get everything else but wisdom, you cannot keep those things that you have. You cannot keep them working. You cannot keep them lasting. But wisdom preserves wisdom, secures uh, wisdom, uh, brings success. So five of them were wise. They were considered wise because they applied wisdom uh, in whatever decision they made. And let us see the decision that they made. You know the story. But I pray that God, the Holy Spirit, will give us insight to God's word today and talk to us personally and individually because, you know, all of us have different needs. We are different stations and different places in our walk with God. There's something you need this morning and the Lord is sufficient to meet that need. Some of us need this parable and some of us and all of us will find ourselves here in this parable. Now, five of them were wise and five were foolish. Now, in verse 3, explain why. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessel with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumber and, and slept. Uh, I got a lamp here for you. Because sometimes it's good, uh, you know, with illustration. Okay, so what happened? Let me put this right here. Okay. All right. Okay. So Jesus said those who were foolish took their lamb. And took no oil with them. In other words, this is all they had for their journey. And this was necessary. This was essential. But then he said, but the wise not only took their lamp, but they took oil in their vessel. You know, uh, I, I hope you can... Uh, uh, use your sanctified imagination this morning uh, this is a vessel and has extra oil so in other words what happened is the what the foolish one traveled this way they they traveled this way 
you know, they, are, they have their lamp in their hand and the other hand is free. You know, but the wise not only took their lamp, but they took a vessel with extra oil in it. Praise the Lord. And so this is what determined their destiny. This decision they made here is what determines their destinies. This is what divides them into two groups. Now, first of all, understand this. Uh, that Jesus was talking to his disciples and people who've come to hear him. And he's saying that the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps. Now, as you read through the gospel, when Jesus uh, expresses the kingdom of heaven, he, he tells a story with it. But then you will notice that not all of the story, you know, uh, appears or at the end of the story becomes perfect. There's always some problems or defect or disappointment, even as he started out with the kingdom of heaven is like. What I'm trying to say is that most of us will assume that when he says the kingdom of heaven is like this, every other thing that he says about the kingdom must be perfect. No, it is not. Why? Because uh, God's doing and dealing here on earth has to do with men. And men always mess up the programs and the purposes of God. And what God has chosen to do with us and deal with us, and so this is why. Because God sometimes cannot even do what he wants to do because some man is involved. Remember, it was his intention to deliver all those people from Egypt and bring them into a promised land. That was the plan. And guess what? Many of them, and most of them, died in the wilderness. That was not the will of God. So, the kingdom of heaven is like this, and you've seen. Right away, Jesus has told us that the decision they made determined their end. Now, five of them were wise. Why? They were considered wise because they applied the wisdom of foresight. Uh, what is foresight? The ability to judge or anticipate future problems and therefore making a plan. They took care to make a proper provision beforehand and left nothing to be done in the last moment. Now, are you, are you getting the idea? The wise virgins acted with prudence. One of the benefits of wisdom is foresight. Proverbs 22 and verse 3, Proverbs 22 verse 3 says, A prudent man foresees the evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. A prudent man foresees evil, and hides himself, but the simple pass on, and our punish. Foresight is vision, and vision gives clarity. Clarity produces understanding. Understanding leads to anticipation. Anticipation produces readiness. Readiness leads to preparation, and preparation brings success. No one ever wins a war without anticipation and readiness. In our Proverbs 6, and in verse 6 through 8, Proverbs 6, verse 6 through 8 says, Go to the end, you slugger, you lazy man, go to the end. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer, and gather her food in the harvest. This is the wisdom of foresight. So the, the, the uh, uh, King Solomon said, uh, you know, go to the ant and learn her ways. They, the ant have no supervisor, no supervision, but they have a sense of time. They know what to do. Well, what do we do in our summertime? You know, we lay out in, 
in the backyard, we're having a picnic, you know, eating barbecue, fries, and all of those things. And you will see the ant come also to the picnic, but they didn't come to have picnic. They're taking the crumbs, you know, because in the summer, that's the time they prepare for winter. And so everything in nature, you know, teach us wisdom. Or the beasts of the, the field, the trees of the field, even those animals in the ocean, everything, you know, prefers uh, a lesson in wisdom. So uh, the king said, you lazy man, you know, you who do not have foresight, who do not know how to anticipate and see what could happen uh, in the future and make preparation. Uh, young man, young, young woman, this time will never, never come back again. This is the time for you to prepare because everything has time and everything has season. You know, uh, within season are times. You know, a, a season uh, is, is a longer a, a period, but there is time. You know, when, when the first day of spring, even before the first day of spring, you will notice if you have a garden, you know, um, your, your, the little flowers will be budding and some already come up by the first day of spring but because they are, you know, early, early bloomers and they indicate the season has come. But there are other, uh, um, you know, spring flowers that will not bud the first few weeks of spring because they are late bloomers. You know, they are in their season, but their time has not come. So that is, that is what time is in between season. And so you cannot miss your time. You cannot waste your time. If you lose an hour, that's an hour, you know, in your life that you cannot recover. So the first lesson here is the lesson uh, in living in wisdom, making sure, you see, every day we have to make choices. Every day we have to make decisions so we need to make sure that the decisions that we are making, you know, are made in wisdom. My friends, you know, uh, you know, there are people who wake up every day to have to solve a problem. A problem that they, they, they send over to, to this day. When you're making decisions now, that decision will, eat, will do one or two things for you. If you make a choice or a decision now, that decision will either clear your way or will clutter your way. In other words, you can make a decision now that will send trouble ahead. Or you can make a decision now that will clear the way. And so when you wake up the next day, you are now solving the problem that you carry over from yesterday. And by the time you finish dealing with that problem, then you still have the problem of the day. And life becomes burdensome. You're carrying a load, you're carrying a weight all around. So when you're making decisions, see, at the end of the day, 10 of them came out. All of them were virgins. All of them were qualified to meet the bride. Everyone had the same opportunity. But somewhere along the line, they made choices. They made decisions that alter their destiny. Make sure that your decision and your choices are lining up with your future. With whatever you're going, make sure when you're making that decision, you are you know, making decision that is aligned, that agree with who you want to become and who you are. What does it mean to be wise? Jesus explained uh, in, in Matthew 7 and verse 24 through 27. Matthew 7, verse 24 to 27. Jesus said, Therefore, whoever hears the sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floors came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall. For it was founded on, on the rock. Praise the Lord. Amen. Jesus explained that, uh, and the rain descended, 
the floor of sin, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for he was founded on the rock. Verse 26 says, But everyone who hears this saying of mine and does not do them, uh, and does not do them, will be likened to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So, as you're hearing God's word, uh, you also are deciding whether you're a wise man or you are not. You know, wis wisdom is always or shown by its works. Uh, you know, wisdom is also shown by its works. So, wisdom is action. Wisdom is, yes, you can have knowledge and you acquire information, but unless you apply that knowledge that you have acquired, there is no wisdom. Now, that is what it means to be wise. Jesus explained, those who hear God's word and do them are wise. Now, uh, the other were considered foolish because of a decision that neglected an action plan in case of future problems. Now, these will come to us every single day. We have to make these decisions. Uh, we have to uh, make choices. But let us uh, make choices and decisions uh, and make sure we foresee all the possibilities and make our decision based on that. Why were they foolish? Uh, and verse 3 tells us, They that were foolish took their lambs and took no oil with them. You know, uh, it, it seemed to be a very simple thing. But, you know, nothing is simple. Everything that we do as human beings uh, does not only affect just one realm. It affects every other realm. You know, we, we do things based on our feelings, our emotions. We also do things based on the reserve of our knowledge. So everything is not just simple. So when, when it was time to go meet the bridegroom and the foolish took their lamp, which they needed. They took the lamp because without the lamp they couldn't see. So that, 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 that was essential. But they were foolish because they took their lamps and took no oil with them. They were foolish because they did not plan against the worst that could happen. They didn't cover all the bases. A military strategy said the effectiveness of military strategy depends entirely upon whether all possibilities have been foreseen. Now, now when you're going to go meet your enemy, uh, you have to foresee all possibilities. You have to think. And, you know, this is where it makes the difference between one man and the other. There are those who don't want to think. Thinking is too much exercise. And that is what happens in life. You need to be thinking. You know, God has given us uh, this endowment, and that is what makes us think. Look, look at a horse. A horse is stronger, much, much powerful than a man. But guess what? A man can still ride a horse and put him in subjection. The only difference, you know, is not physical power. It is mental power. And that's what made us, you know, the crown of, of creation. Because God has endowed us with great uh, intellect, the ability to think. My friends, you have to live introspectively. You know, life is more than just what you see on the outside. If you do not use your brain, somebody else will use it for you. Somebody else will tell you what you need to do, what you need to eat, where you need to go, what you need to wear, how you need to do it, where to put it. You know, you need to be introspective. Think on your own. Just think, for example, it's not everything that they tell you that is right. Praise the Lord. Because those people are telling you so they can eventually get into your wallet. Because they were foolish because, you know, they did not, you know, prepare for what could happen. They, they exempt themselves, you know, from thinking about what could happen. And you know what? It's very easy. When you don't want to think, the next thing that happens is to assume. 
you will always assume. Instead of you to get something done and take care of a matter, you will assume that somebody else, somebody else will do it. Yes, somebody else will do it. And in most time, you have to pay for it. You know, while you're still sleeping, somebody else woke up and go make coffee. And when you wake up, you go pay them, you know, to drink the coffee. You know, uh, they were foolish. Jesus used those words, foolish. What is foolish? Foolish meaning acted with, without, you know, wisdom. We may ask, but why? What could be their reason for not carrying the extra oil with them? Uh, because people do not do anything without why, why? Why? What could be their reason? Could it be that carrying a vessel, uh, carrying a vessel along with the lamp was more work, a burden, extra work? There are some who will do and who will not do anything extra after they have done the ordinary. It's not going the extra mile, the common factor in every Sussex story. Why? Why would they just go out and not prepare for what could happen? Is it not what is required? The extra thing, is that not what is required in every sphere of life uh, and living? Whether in domestic or national affairs, in career, in sports, in academics, in relationship, in ministry, there is no difference among mediocres. Distinction is found where there is the spirit of excellence. The first mile is overcrowded with competitors. It is in the extra mile that you lose the rivalry. Try to be extraordinary, whatever you are. Try to be an extraordinary son, an extraordinary daughter, an extraordinary husband, extraordinary wife, extraordinary mother, student, employee, Christian, minister, or pastor. Try to do more so you can become more. Why did they not take into consideration what could happen? Because some people do not try to do anything extra. My friends, do more. Do more than exists. Make sure you leave. Do more than grow. Make sure you bloom. Do more than just think. Uh, make sure you create. Do more than share. Make sure you give. Do more than just forgive. Make sure you forget. Do more than just dream. Make sure you do what you dream. Do more than change. Make sure you improve. Do more than just leave. Make sure you leave for Jesus. Praise the Lord. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 through 10. Uh, we, why? What could be their reason for not carrying the extra oil? Could it be carrying a, a, a vessel in one hand along with the lamp in the other hand was more work? The Apostle Peter tells us this and admonishes us. He said, for this very reason, and you have to read you know what he has written before that but you can understand what he's talking about about our salvation and all that God has uh, blessed us with and so for but also for this very reason giving all diligence diligence in other words making every effort add to your faith here is the problem many people have just gotten faith they will tell you that they have only one testimony. And that testimony is that I was saved. I was saved 20 years ago. I was saved 40 years ago. I was saved. I was saved. I, I have faith. Yes. The Apostle Peter said, make every effort. Give in all diligence. Add. Add to your faith. Have you ever been served a food and you tasted it and you, you look and you say, okay, can you give me salt, please? And you add a little salt. Whatever you needed to add to 
means that in itself is not sufficient. Peter is saying, who but Peter can tell us? Uh, it's add to your faith. What add to your faith virtue? You know, a lot of people have faith but no virtue. Uh, you know, they, they, they bring the name of the Lord in the mud. There is no virtue. No, no, nobody can look at you and say you are a Christian. There, there is no, no character. I said, no, it's not going to work. You need virtue. You need, you need character. You need moral, moral character with your faith. And then, when you have heard virtue, add knowledge. <laughs> Ignorance is not fruit of the Spirit. You know, uh, there is no such thing as anointed ignorance. You know, add knowledge. Know what you're talking about. Know why you believe why you believe. Because you see, our faith has suffered more, more from philosophers than those who beat us and imprison us. There are people who are intellectuals and they attack your faith. You need to know. You need to know Jesus for yourself and why you believe in him. Add to your faith knowledge. And when you've added knowledge, my friend, add self-control. <laughs> self-control. Uh, and, and to self-control, in verse 6, he said, and to self-control, add perseverance. And to perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, mutual affection. And to mutual affection, Love, brotherly kindness. Oh, how do we need that, you know, nowadays? People of faith, we need brotherly kindness, uh, godliness. And to that, verse 8 goes on, and, and, and it says, For if, if you possess, if these things are yours, if you possess them and are bound, and you grow in self-control, godliness, knowledge, virtue, and add it to your faith. If these things are yours and they are bound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a lot of barrenness you know, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is why people can have faith today and then next tomorrow they, they are gone back you know, into the world where the Lord found them from. Many of us are just, you know, one step away from where the Lord found us from. You know, so what could be their reason for not carrying the extra oil? Why? Because they didn't want to do anything extra. They didn't want to do what They'll come to church on Sunday, but that's just about it. They will not do extra, you know, carrying, carrying uh, the lamp. Ah, praise the Lord. <laughs> And then, these with two hands. That is too much, Bishop. You know what? Uh, let, me, let me have a free hand, you know, so that I can do other things with this free hand. You know what? Uh, you know, you not do prayer. You not, you not do Bible study. You're just living. Nothing extra. My friend, you know, this is what's going to happen. And this is what happened in this story. You see, the light went off. The light went out. Why did the light go out, my friends? Let's continue in our story. Why? What could be their reason for not carrying the extra oil with them? Because, you know, maybe that was too much work. Maybe another reason. Could it be that they concluded it was unnecessary? They assumed they will not need it. Uh, they, they, did, they assumed the bridegroom will come early. And that whatever they had will just be enough. Could it, could it be that they concluded, you know what, you know, uh, assumption is actually traceable to mental laziness. You know, people who, who will not do what they're supposed to do and just assume it will be done. It's, it's, it's a sign of mental laziness and spiritual. And when it comes to spiritual life, it's a sign of spiritual listening. Uh, why did they go out with just enough thing of the extra? Uh, if, if somebody is sitting next to you uh, this morning and hearing this message, can you help me tell them? Because I can, I can reach them. I can tell them. Tell them you're going to need the extra oil. 
You're going to need the extra oil. You're going to need it. Did they assume that they will not need it? Did they assume it was unnecessary? Did, did they assume that the bridegroom will come early and they will be fine and not need the extra oil? But this assumption was based on unknown factor. They do not know, nobody knew when the bridegroom will come. Are you hearing me this morning? Nobody knows when Jesus will come. But he is coming. Are you preparing? Are you? The question is not whether he is coming. The question really is, are you ready? Are you ready for the bridegroom is coming at an hour that we do not know? Are you ready to meet your God? Are you ready to meet the Savior? What could be their reason? They thought maybe uh, it was unnecessary. There are people who, who get up. You, you, you are able to go, up, go along with your week. Without your devotion to the Lord, without, without serving Him in one way or the other, without reading your Bible, without having a time for God. You have time for, don't say you don't have time. That's not ever a problem. You have time for what you want to do. Uh, my job is, I'm not prying into your business. This is the message from the Lord, from the Lord to you and to me. My, my job is to tell you what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. I need to spend time with the Lord to make my relationship real. Now, just for you two, for you, your relationship to be real, uh, you have to spend time with God. You have to allow Him to, to you know, minister to you while you also minister to the Lord. So, our first lesson is lesson in living in wisdom. You and I pretty much determine what happens to us by the choices we make. So it was, a, it was a, a, a problem of neglect, a problem of assumptions. So the second lesson is a lesson against assumption. An assumption is evidence of the absence of truth. Because we make assumption when we don't know the truth. You know, you know, and, and for wherever there is truth, there is no need for assumptions. Since we all must live with the reality of needing to make assumptions sometimes, then it is better to make a calculated assumption. That is to make assumptions that limit our losses. It is better to assume to err, to, better to assume or err on the side of caution. All the ten virgins made assumptions. They all made assumptions. The foolish virgins assumed that the bridegroom will come early and that the oil that they had in their lamp will be sufficient for them. But the wise virgin also assumed, should in case the bridegroom delay his coming, then there will be a need for the extra oil. Therefore, they carried a reserve of oil. Both of them assumed. Now, the assumption, uh, as the assumption of the wise limited their losses. Because if the bridegroom came late, they have the extra oil. But if the bridegroom come early, all they will have is just extra oil. But unfortunately, the bridegroom was delayed, and the foolish virgins did not have enough oil to keep them waiting for the bridegroom. So it is better uh, to have the extra oil and not need it than to need it and not have it. It is the same with Jesus, my friend. Oh, you're better off having Jesus and not need him. They need him and not have him. Assumption, as I said before, be a sign of mental laziness. Think true when you're making a decision, when you're making choices. All ten virgins were qualified to meet the bridegroom. All were expected. All went out to meet him. 
five of them were foolish because they took their lambs and no extra supply of oil in their vessel. The foolish virgins presume that whatever they had will be enough. And I assume that the bridegroom will come early. Are you presuming? Oh yeah, I went to prayer meeting last, last week. I went to prayer conference last month. And you don't need prayer for today? Are you assuming? Are you assuming? You don't know what kind of devil you're going to meet today, my friend. You need to be prayed up. You cannot invent weapons on the war, on the, on the battlefield. This old parable it's about readiness, my friend. Jesus is teaching us about Christian growth and readiness, that you need to be ready. Because, you know, you never know when you will have to deal with issues. You don't import strength on the day of confrontation with the enemy and problems of life. You need to, just like birds. They don't eat in the air. Birds only eat on the ground. And whatever they eat on the ground, that's what they have for their flight. Ah, my friends, when we fail to exercise our mental, physical, and spiritual powers, we fall into assumption. The second lesson is lesson against assumption. Praise the Lord. Life is filled with choices, the ones we need to make every day that shape our destinies. There are many, like these foolish virgins, who make life decisions based on presumptions and don't care to be a little bit more introspective. Now, are you a young man out there? You still have your life, your vigor. The Bible says that the glory of young men is their strength. This is the time you've got all the strength to do whatever because the day is coming that you will want to run but your back and your legs will not allow you. And some days are coming when your eyes start getting dim. This is the time that you need. You cannot waste this time. Now, there's some of you, and I want you to think of it now. You're just sitting around. You're sitting around. You're wasting time. You know, what are you assuming about the future? Who's going to take care of your responsibility? You know, who... Who, in this, in this world when everybody's after their own, who will take care of your uh, responsibility? You have an opportunity now, your brain is still fresh, you can go to college and, 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 and get some education. You're going to need it. Now somebody said, you know, uh, what am I going to do with algebra? I said, look, there's a lot you're going to do with algebra. There's a lot you're going to do with mathematics. There's a lot you're going to do with what you learn. Our world is, is growing, is getting super developed. You cannot get by without some passport, and that will be education. Or whatever it is, it doesn't have to be education, but do something with your life now. This is about readiness, getting ready for the days ahead. Now look at what happened. You know, their life went out, my friends, completely out. And then we read uh, in verse 6. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose. All of them, all of them ten arose and trimmed their lambs. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil for our lambs are going out. Our lambs are going out. Give us some of your oil, for our lambs are going out. Verse 9. Very sad but true reply. But the wise answer, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and Buy for yourselves. Buy for yourselves. Buy for yourselves. It is okay to help people out of problems and give whenever we can. But there are some things you cannot borrow. 
Some things, my friends, you cannot borrow. There, there, there are some who believe that others must always buy them out of self-caused problems or help them out every time they get themselves into troubles they could have avoided. Give us some of your oil. Uh, you know, some people could have avoided some problems, but they were once unwilling. To do what they needed to do so they can have what they wish to have. What they thought was unnecessary, what they thought was not needed or required before, that is the extra oil, is now the most essential thing they needed now. They begged, and here is their reason for our lamps. I've gone out. It was once burning, but now it's gone out. Our hope was once strong, but now it's lost. Our faith was once strong, but now it's weak. Our love once fervent, but now dead. They begged, and here is their reason. The anointing was once strong, but now uh, it's gone, like Samson. Samson played and played and played and played and played with his anointing, and one day he woke up, he shook himself, but the anointing was gone. The spirit had left him because he has prostituted, he had prostituted God's gift and the anointing upon his life. So was Saul, the head that once wore the crown. First king of Israel lost his crown, lost his anointing, lost his kingdom because he was unwilling to do something which was to have a relationship with God, to know God for himself. The anointing was was strong but now it's gone. And maybe somebody out there, you know, the spirit is reminding you that your devotion to the Lord was once sweet, but now it's no longer sweet. Your service, your ministry to the Lord was fervent, but now it's gone out. Here is the result of unpreparedness, and that is the message of our Lord. Those who were ready, those who were ready, those who were ready. Let me say to you, you are allowed to do anything now to prepare for yourself. And you also... You know, may not prepare, but there is a day coming. You know, there is a day coming. You know, we, we celebrate birthday, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Frank's Day, Valentine's Day, National Day, all of those days. But there is a judgment day also. My friends, those who were ready. And at this point in time, mercy, mercy draws the line and shut the door. Because they were not prepared. The advantage of foresight is that it leads to preparation. Think through when you're making assumption. Uh, they, they find themselves now ill-prepared. This is not a situation they couldn't have helped. How did they who were qualified to meet the bridegroom in the beginning now are disqualified? How is it that those who started out well and on a merit of their own, now turn into beggars. Yeah, you hear in the Spirit speaking to you. Jesus is coming. Oh, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. In fact, you know, you know, remember what he said to the disciples in John chapter 14. He said, do not let your heart be in trouble. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go I, I, to prepare a place for you. And then I will come back to take you unto myself. But in that statement, Jesus said, If I go, then I will come back. If I go, then I will come back. Notice the if. Is not on the comeback. The if is on if I go. Now, did he go? 
Yes. He left. He went. Will he come back? Certainly. He will come back. My friends, are you ready? Are you ready? The third lesson in this parable is the lesson of paying attention to the spiritual life. See, my friend, the lamp is visible, but the oil is kept in the reserve. You see, when the light is on, you know, the lamp, that's all you see. The lamp is visible, but the oil that makes the the, the, the light shine is kept in the reserve. That's not seen. Every plant has two lives. The visible life, which is the stem, the branches, the leaves, and the fruits. And then the invisible life, the one on the ground, that's the root, which is more important, the visible or the invisible part of the plant, which is more important. Which is more important as you look at a story building, a, a skyscraper, which is, which is more important? Is the 50th floor more important than the foundation? They were once unwilling to pay attention to the reserve. My friend, without the roots on the plant, there cannot be fruits on the plant. The roots is essential for the sustenance of the whole tree. So it is with the spiritual life. It is the source of nourishment for the whole life. In Second uh, Colossians chapter two, verse six through seven, uh, the apostle Paul wrote to the Colossians and said, "I should therefore have received Christ, Jesus the Lord. So walk in Him, rooted." What rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. Get your roots in Jesus. Jesus is the soil that will wrap our roots around because storms are coming, the floods are coming. But those who are rooted in him, as you pay attention to the inner life force, and then from there you will be built up. But first of all, get rooted. Do not neglect the inner man. Pay attention. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Like the foolish virgins, there are those who think if they had religion, just to let, they will have the external show of religion, which is the light. And that, sh and that should be enough. But the secret reserve of the store of oil, which is the Spirit's power in a believer's life, they don't think that is necessary. Just as the light cannot be sustained without the oil, so also the light of profession cannot be sustained without the oil of prayer. And the light of faith cannot be sustained without the oil of grace. The lamp is burning bright only because there is a secret reserve of oil supplying the lamp. Oh, you see somebody with anointing and you want to be like that. Oh, you don't know where the secret, the secret, the secret reserve of oil. The instruction to pay attention to the inner life is almost the subject of every book of the Bible. Hebrews 4 verse 11 says, Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following the examples of disobedience. And Hebrews 12 and chapter uh, 12 verse 1 also say, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the same which so easily ensnare us and let us run with patience or endurance the race that is set before. My beloved, do you realize there is a race that is set before you and you must accomplish that race, my beloved. Let us run. Let us run. Luke chapter 13, verse 24. Jesus said, 
Make every effort to enter. Are you, are you hearing the words of the scripture? Make effort with all diligence. I don't know what kind of Bible some people are reading who are telling people, just take it easy. It doesn't take all of that. Just, just take it easy. <laughs> you know, I don't know what kind of Bible they're reading. Jesus said, you know, make effort. Luke 13 verse 24. Make effort, every effort to enter through the narrow door. Because many, I tell you, will try to enter it and will not be able to. Amen. In Luke 21, verse 36, Jesus also said, Be always on the watch. Luke 21, 36. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus is coming. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all all these things that will come to pass, things that are going to happen very soon, and to stand before the Son of Man. Diligence, uh, paying attention to the welfare of the inner man. Continuous and steady spiritual growth is key to abundant living. That's our fourth lesson. First Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Amen. Uh, the apostle is talking to the Corinthians and he said, Do you not know that those who wrong in a race? We have read that scripture before that says where there is a race that is set before us. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? The first line is full of all that run. But one received the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Run in such a way that you will be the winner. You are not given the prize because you are listed in the race. You're given the prize because you broke the tape. It's a run in such a way that you, you may obtain it. Verse 25 says, And everyone who... Compete for the price is temperate. In other words, the word means discipline in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. So, uh, there is no taking it easy. It is a call to diligence, uh, to spiritual readiness. This is what this parable is about. It's not just a story in passing. Notice, they started out well. That is, those other five started out well, but they could not continue at a point in time. They were not steady. They were not steadfast. Uh, steadfastness is key to spiritual success. There is no time that you should, you know, slow down in your walk with God. Continue to grow in grace. My friend, look, there is the lamp. There is the light. And there is the oil. Inseparable. But there are people, the ordinary mind will think, if the virgins had gone out with their, without their lamps, that would be foolishness. If they had just gone out without lamp, people will say, oh, that is foolish. <laughs> but the divine mind, Jesus said, it is foolishness to venture out without careful and thoughtful consideration of how to sustain the light. God has given you a light. There is a light in you now, and it's up to you now to find ways you need to sustain it by prayer, by, by, by study, by fellowship, by all the virtues that we have read before. In the mind of the foolish virgins, the lamp is one thing and the oil is another. Therefore, they could take their lamps without oil in their vessels. The point here is that there are some things in life we cannot separate. There are certain virtues that cannot flourish unless complemented by other attending virtues. For example, power. 
without self-control leads to disaster. Prominence without humility leads to ruins. So is faith without knowledge, and faith without love, and faith without works leads to disappointment. You need the lamb for the light. You need the lamb for the light. But the light cannot stay on without the oil. There is no light without the lamp, but you cannot keep the light on without the oil. There are many in the world who do not have lamps, therefore do not have light and in darkness, because they have not come to the knowledge of the Son of God. And there are some who have both the lamps, they have their lamp and light, but their light is dimming because they are low on oil. Are you low on oil? You know, these few months have taught us uh, that there is a difference between Bethel and El Bethel. Bethel, the house of God, and El Bethel, the God of the house of God. There are many who had Bethel. Their, 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 their high and their, their religion and their devotion is only tied to church. They get happy when they can come to church. And I'm not saying there's something wrong with that. But unfortunately, in the past few months, we have not been able to come to church. Did you have the God of the house of God? They can take away Bethel from you, but they can't take away El Bethel, the God of the house. So my friend, the lamp, the light and the oil cannot be separated. You need that reserve to go on. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you have power from on high? My friends, there are things you cannot borrow. No matter how much I like you, no matter how much you're my friends, some things you, you cannot borrow. You have to get yourself. The best I can do for you is that you can share in my light, but you cannot share my own. I cannot borrow Michael Jordan's ability uh, to play basketball. You know, when I travel you know, around the world, some little kids think, you know, I look like Michael Jordan. I'm as tall as him. My name is Michael. <laughs> but I cannot borrow his ability. I have a friend who can preach, who can sing, who can do this. I cannot borrow their ability. I can share in their gifts. There's some things you cannot borrow. You have to be diligent. You have to walk and you have to sustain. You have to fan the flame uh, of the fire that God has set within you, my friends. You're going to need the extra oil. You're going to need the extra mile. You're going to need the extra prayer. You're going to need the study of the word of God. You're going to need fasting. You're going to need fellowship. You're going to, to need evangelism. You're going to need worship. Do you have the extra oil? Help me tell somebody this morning, you're going to need that extra oil. You're going to need that. You know, there are devils out there that we need to face every single day. Are you prepared? Are you prepared for the things to come? We can only sustain it by the oil of prayer, by the oil of diligence, by the oil of devotion. Shall we pray? Precious Father, we thank you today, Lord. We bless you for your word. How grateful we are this morning, Lord, for your word that comes to challenge us, to encourage us, Lord, to bless us. Father, we need to fan the flame, fan this fire into flames, Lord. We need the extra oil. Help us, Lord, to overcome spiritual, mental, and physical laziness 
those things that stop us. Your word uh, comes to tell us to strive, to enter in, to make every effort, to be diligent. And sometimes we take our spiritual life not so seriously. Help us today, baptize us afresh. Lord, by the power of your spirit, that Lord, more than ever, that we will be ready for you are coming any time. Help us to get ourselves ready. Help us not to be like the foolish virgins and that they're just trying to prepare when it was too late. The door was shut. They have lost eternal opportunity and there was nothing to, to do anymore. It was all over for them. Let us not be like that that loses our opportunity and lose our destinies, Lord. Help us today, O oh God, for what we have learned to be more diligent in prayer, in devotion, in fellowship, in worship, in the study of your word, O oh God, and in evangelism. We thank you, we bless your name. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Give me oil in my lamp, Lord. Keep me burning. If you're out there, my friend, and you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, why don't you, you know, pray this prayer with me and ask Jesus in your heart and life. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. I praise your name this morning. I come in the name of Jesus. I am sorry for my sins. I ask for forgiveness. Today, I receive Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. Lord Jesus, I give my heart to you today. I ask that you come in my life and be my Savior. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that God had raised him from the dead and is here with me, here in my prayer now. I commit my future into your hands and I thank you for the gift of salvation. This I ask. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. All right, my friends, I want to thank all of you for tuning in today and joining us. May the Lord bless you week ahead. Until next time, press on, pray up, look up, and stay well. Bye-bye for now.